All right, so um, as you know, I, I am a, I'm an amateur in almost all the areas in which we've been talking about so far. I'm a philosopher. And of course, when one starts looking at these kinds of issues as a philosopher, one immediately starts philosophizing about them. So what I, knowing that we're at the end of a long day, we're going to have some light philosophy, and I will try and be fairly brief so that we can keep well on time. Before I say anything, though, I would just like to thank every, all of our speakers very much for coming, and I'd especially like to thank Saskia and Holly for organizing this conference. All of you will have had contact with at least one of them, I suspect both of them. When we suggested having a conference like this, I thought, oh no, I've got to organize the thing. It turned out I didn't have to organize it. This has been the most wonderfully smooth conference from my point of view, because they have done everything. So let us thank them very much. OK, so I take as my title, quotation from Morris, from William Morris, The Strange Idea of Restoration. I was brought up in England. Anyone brought up in England who knows anything about the National Trust or the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings internalizes a certain view of the wrongness of restoration and the rightness of preservation. We, I mean, for generations now, we've been brought up with this thought. And the thought is basically that restoring, that is, an, an attempting to take things back to how we think they were, is a mistake. What you should do is basically stabilize, protect. Perhaps you can't do that terribly well. If not, you let the thing decay. You do your best to, to, to stabilize. If you intervene in any way that alters the fabric, you do it in a way which is immediately recognizable from someone else. And that's how one should proceed. I'd always just thought that was right, but I'd never, it had never really thought, occurred to me to think about why that was right and what the theory is that lies behind it. And as I've been working on this project, I've started to think a bit more about why we think that. And the obvious text you go back to for the origins of that idea are Morris's words in the manifesto, the manifesto, his anti-scrape manifesto, um, written at the foundation by him and a group of others of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And I've started with a few paragraphs from that. So let me just read out some of that in typical ringing Morris prose. So he says, from this lack and this gain, and the lack here is, he thinks, the lack of any civilized 19th century style. Every other century up till then has had a civilized style. He thinks even the 18th, um, but the 19th doesn't. So there's the lack. And then there's a gain. The gain is this interest, this enthusiasm for ancient buildings, which he's seen come around him from a number of people, most immediately from Pugin, people around him, but very many people interested there. But so from the lack and the gain arose in men's mind the strange idea of the restoration of ancient buildings, and a strange and most fatal idea, which by its very name implies that it's possible to strip from a building this, that, and the other part of its history, of its life, that is, and then to stay the hand at some arbitrary point and leave it still historical living and even as it once was. A little bit further on. If repairs were needed, if ambition or piety pricked on to change, that change, in the past he means, was of necessity wrought in the unmistakable fashion of the time. So this is how things used to be done. This is what Morris approves of. Um, a church of the 11th century might be added to or altered in the 20th, 13th, sorry, in the 12th, well, maybe in the 20th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, or even the 17th or 18th century. But every change, whatever history it destroyed, left history in the gaps. All right, crucial idea there and was alive with the spirit of the deeds done midst its fashioning. So having established his case, he thinks there, he then goes on, we plead to put, in, to put protection in the place of restoration, to resist all tampering with either the fabric or ornament of the building as it stands, if it has become inconvenient for its present use, to raise another building rather than alter or enlarge the old one. In fine, to treat our ancient buildings as monuments of a bygone art, created by bygone manners, 
that modern art cannot meddle without destroying. Okay, so I say those are very, very familiar ideas to us all now and have been familiar ideas for over a century. That was 1877 that that was published. Morris, of course, had been to somewhat, res somewhat responsible for some of the earlier meddling. His um, company had been providing glass for replacement windows in, in churches. He stopped doing that soon after publishing this manifesto. So by 1870, Morris and Company would no longer provide glass for churches. Um, I don't know whether they would have provided glass for the combination room here or for the, for the hall. Um, it's an interesting question if we, if we had asked them a few years later. Um, but despite the fact that's such a familiar text, there's something almost, there's something very strange, something almost incoherent, I think, about the position that Morris is arguing for. He complains that the restorers aim to stay the hand at some arbitrary point, right? That's the complaint. And of course, his complaint there is that it's an arbitrary point that you go back to. But he's nonetheless, it seems, doing exactly that himself in what he's suggesting doing. He's saying that all of these interventions up till now, in the earlier centuries, were all right. But that's no longer the case, right? Now we can't intervene in a way that, that puts history in the gap in the way that earlier restorers had succeeded in putting history in the gap. So in a way, he seems at least to be caught doing the very thing that he's complaining about, that is trying to stop history at some arbitrary point. Um, there are two ways you might understand that point. You might think the point is 1877, right? That would be to actually, as philosopher would say, to give it a rigid designator, fix on to that point and stick with it. But as this doctrine has become developed, especially as the SPAB has lived with this doctrine, it isn't that idea at all. It's rather a sort of moving present. That is, whenever you look to intervene, that's the time at which it's illegitimate to change anything. But anything that's happened up till that now becomes legitimate as a result of it having been incorporated. So as, as a prime example of this, um, the Church of St. Helens in Bishopsgate was very badly damaged by a couple of IRA bombs in the early 1990s. And there was a proposal to um, change the floor levels, as, as well as a, a lot of refiguring of, of, of the church there, suggestions by Terry. And the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings gave a brief complaining about the attempt to undo, to, to, to change the configuration. What they were complaining about, though, was a configuration which was put in place by Pearson in 1890, which they themselves had briefed against in 1890. So a hundred years later, they were briefing against their earlier brief. So um, Philip Venning, who has um, been one of the uh, main figures working for the SPAB, um, he comments on this in, in a 2005 piece. Perhaps this is now an irony. Perhaps indeed, yes. Though a moment's thought shows this to be a wholly consistent approach. Well, of course that's true. It is wholly consistent. Consistency is a very easy position um, to, to, to attain. One just gets a line and insists on it. There's no question that it's consistent. The issue is whether it's coherent. Right? The issue is whether there is a justification for thinking of it in that way. I want to suggest that insofar as there is a justification, it's a justification which goes back to Ruskin. I mean, many people have commented, including Morris himself, on the influence, especially of the Seven Lamps, on um, Morris's ideas. And that that justification turns out to be much more complex and much more contentious than one might ordinarily think. So let me say a little bit, a little bit about that. I think there are really two ways of understanding the, the policy. One of them is actually what, what, what Joel was um, alluding to at the end of his talk. It's not that the ideas that, must, that, that Morris was, was um, proposing here are meant to be hard and fast rules for every situation. We should think of these as rules of thumb. Right? We should think of these basically as a warning. It's slow down. 
I mean, in a way, I think that was what was primarily concerning Morris, right? He saw all this destruction going on around him. He, by this time, was very much a political agitator. This was very much at the time when he was increasingly involved in socialist agitation. And he was trying to do something that would just stop what he saw as a great deal of destruction. Quite instrumental, right? This is just something to, to stop it. The second way of thinking of it is not in that sort of rule of thumb way. It's rather to think of it as the real truth. That's to elevate it to a dogma. That is to elevate it to something which will always be true in every case. And I think some of the thinking of the, of, of the SPAB, especially in, in, in the um, St. Helens style cases, suggests that it's tended to move from the rule of thumb to something closer to the dogma. OK, so let's start by thinking about the dogma. I shouldn't call it a dogma, because that's to prejudice the them against, to prejudice things against it. Think of it as an exceptionless rule. That's a perfectly um, neutral way, I think, of thinking about it. Um, and as I say, I think we've really got to go back to Ruskin to see how that, um, how that works. So when you read Ruskin, I mean, it's, I, I'd never really read Ruskin carefully. I mean, he, he's a very impressionistic writer, and he doesn't lay out a single argument. He throws hundreds and hundreds of arguments in there straight away, and you kind of tumble over them and try and... And you end up just sort of swept away, and clearly many people have been swept away. I mean, Proust famously was swept away by the, by the, uh, the Lamp of Memory chapter in, in, um, in The Seven Lamps, and, and that's actually the chapter that I want to, I want to focus on. A couple of quotations just to give you a sense from, from, from this. Um, it is again no question of expediency or feeling whether we shall preserve the buildings of past times or not. We have no right whatever to touch them. They are not ours. They belong partly to those who built them and partly to all the generations of mankind who are to follow us. Well, again, a coherent position, right? I mean, that's consistent, but it's very odd, right? Why do they belong to past people and all the future people? And we are the expressly the one group they don't belong to. Right? That's a very odd position. Again, you can read it both ways. You can read it either in terms of um, a moving present. So every group now is the group which they don't belong to. But that's not really consistent with what he's saying, because he does say they belong to the future group. If not, then you've got to read it as a special claim about us. Now, you might think that Morris, writing at the time when he thought people were acting as Philistines, thought that was exactly right. right. This is just a completely irresponsible group of people. I think in Ruskin, though, it's, it's more rhetoric. You should just accept this as rhetoric. A little bit more. It is impossible, it's impossible to raise the dead to restore anything that has ever been great or beautiful in architecture. Again, what, what's meant there? You might think that that's a necessary truth. You might think it just follows as... As a, just in the nature of the, of the thing. You can't raise the dead. That's a sort of necessary truth. I mean, you know, it's at least plausibly a necessary truth. But restoring anything is akin to trying to raise the dead. It involves some attempt to get a biological, something like a biological thing back into a state which it is no longer possible to put it into. Or you might rather think, if you were to try to do this, you would mess it up. OK. So let's... That's not an essential claim. That's a contingent claim about our own abilities to do these sort of things. So if we look at the text, I think there are actually five different ideas that are there in Ruskin. And I want to just pull those five different ideas out and, and address them one at a time. So one theme, clearly there. Um, he thinks that any restoration will be shoddy, badly designed, badly made. So he talks about the cheapest and basest imitation which can escape, escape detection. Secondly, he thinks you can't know whether a restoration will be historically accurate. You just don't have the knowledge that is needed to do that properly. So he said, if you attempt to restore that finish, you will do it conjecturally. And doing something conjecturally is wrong in um, Ruskin's thoughts here. Um, thirdly, and this comes back to a theme several people have mentioned and, and that you were mentioning earlier. The idea is that any restoration will be a fake, right? Or as he puts it, 
The thing is a lie from beginning to end. Um, quite a different point, right, to the, the first two. This is a quite different thought. Third one. The restoration won't be old. Now, that's a theme which never gets spelt out perfectly in the Ruskin, but it comes up repeatedly, I think. And he does say things like, a, a new thing will lack some sweetness in the gentle lines which rain and sun had wrought. Those kinds of thoughts come up repeatedly. And then finally, um, there's the thing which I think is perhaps the most powerful line that Ruskin has there, which is really just the thought that the, the restoration won't have been there in the way that the original was. Um, and in particular, and this really picks up on the idea that's there in that lamp of architecture, the, the, the memory lamp, um, it won't provide the basis of memory. And he, Ruskin says at one point, we may live without her architecture, that is, may worship without her, but we cannot remember without her. So the crucial role of architecture is in order to provide a framework, what people elsewhere would nowadays call an architecture or a superstructure, to enable memory to happen. Right? That's the idea which, of course, Proust was so moved by, right? the, the little room upstairs in Combray that enables you, when you go back there, to recover memories which are encapsulated in the, in the fabric of the of the architecture around you. Okay, so I, you know, I want to raise all of these because I think these are all extremely interesting ideas. I think they're all ideas we need to pay heed to. Um, let me just say a little bit about them all, though. I mean, the first and second are clearly, that is the idea of architecture being, uh, of restoration being shoddy or being historically inaccurate. I mean, those seem to be contingent claims, right? And there's just a question as to how good your craftspeople are, how good your artists are. And there's a question as to how much you happen to know, right? And sometimes we will have better people, other times we will have worse, sometimes we will have more knowledge, other times we will have less. Note, if you have an artefact which was removed and you still have it, then putting it back is not vulnerable to either of those cr criticisms, right? So, for instance, if we were to put back the window which we have there, you can't complain that that's of worst craftsmanship or inaccurate. Of course, if someone were to restore another part of it, then we might, then, then those worries might, might arise. But for the bit that's put back, those aren't, those aren't worries that can be um, legitimately raised. Thirdly, the restoration will be a fake. It will be a lie from beginning to end. Well, a lie is a comp uh, it's quite a complex notion, right? A lie? A, a lie requires a number of things. It requires an intention on the part of the person who's doing it, and it requires a certain um, construction of fabrication. The intention has to be something like an intention to deceive. One doesn't get a lie. There's big philosophical literature I can discuss with you if you want as to whether you can lie without intending to deceive. Most philosophers think an intention to deceive is... is the essence of a lie, certainly some, something like that seems to be, seems to be right. Um, and also the people have to be taken in by it, right? I mean, at, at least um, there needs to be enough plausibility to the lie to make it a worthwhile lie. So there again, the, the thing is contingent, right? Of course you can do a restoration which is designed as a fake. It happens all the time. You can pretend it's old when it isn't. Um, but also, you can, put a, you can put the kinds of signs that you were, you were talking about that make it very clear it isn't a fake. Some of those are, of course, exactly the things that some rest, restoration looks at. But you, you could think that you can put the signs not intrinsic to the thing, but extrinsic to it. That is, you could tell people. You could put the information there in such a way that it was very clear to people that what they were looking at was not the original. That is enough to undermine the idea of it being a lie, I think, even if you might think there's something inauthentic about it. But that's something we, could, we can come back to. OK, fourth and fifth, I think, are in many ways the most interesting. Um, so the fourth is just the idea that it won't be old. 
And the fifth is the idea that it won't provide the framework for memory that we want it to do. The fourth, well, of course it's true it won't be old in the right way. Not, of course, if one's putting back something that was removed. But if one is making a new version, it's not going to be old. But in a way, that's a somewhat question-begging complaint, I think. Because in a way, what we wanted was to know why putting something in that wasn't old was meant to be wrong. So just pointing out that it isn't old doesn't seem to be doing the work we wanted, unless there's some intrinsic value to the old. And I'm not sure what that is, if, if, if there is meant to be some. So that's something we could, we could talk about. Um, so let's move on to the fifth one, which I think in a way is kind of what underlies the thought that it's, its antiquity is in itself a good thing, um, or a, a basis of value. So that's the idea that having been there enables it to be the structure around which memories are derived. Now, where does Ruskin get that idea from? I think that this is clearly an allusion back, or is influenced by, an 18th century literature um, of the associationists. So these are people coming from Locke, but working in aesthetic areas more and more. And they culminate in, in this book, Essays on the Nature and Principles of Taste, by Archibald Allison, um, Scottish uh, divine and, and, and philosopher who um, actually explicitly talks about architecture at one point and talks about the antiquity there. Now, the main idea these people have is that the source of aesthetic value is via the mental attitudes of the people who are looking at the thing. So they don't think of aesthetic value as being an intrinsic feature of the object. They think that aesthetic value is generated in the observer in some way. This is an old, this dates back to sort of general sentimentalist ways of thinking about the nature of both moral and aesthetic value that are there in Locke and there in, in Hume and, and, and other sentimentalist thinkers. Very much the dominant um, English and Scottish way of thinking um, through to this point. Influential as well on Kant and, and, uh, and, uh, and other continental thinkers. If you've got that view, then of course if you remove something which no longer answers to memory, you have removed aesthetic value. And if memory requires seeing the thing as you saw it, then, of course, you have destroyed a, you have destroyed a source of value. Um, for Alison, I think you have destroyed the only source of value because he thinks that it is, the value is entirely constituted by those kinds of attitudes. But hang on, wait a little bit. Two things to say about this. First thing to say, well, memory is part of that. But memory isn't the only mental attitude that, that is evoked by architecture. So, and, and of course, this is something that Ruskin himself acknowledges. There are the other six lamps. Right? There's beauty and, and so on. Um, so you know, going back to Morris, at the end of News From Nowhere, Morris um, goes back to, to, to Kelmscott House with Ellen, the, the woman He's witness this very erotically charged passage where he, they, they come up on the, on the boat and they leave and they go ahead. And um, she gets to the house and she puts her arm on the stone and um, she says how, how beautiful it is. And you can see this is the epitome for, for Morris of the appreciation of beauty there. She's never been there before. That's crucial. Right? She's never been to that house before. But she manages to respond to its beauty because of a set of associations which are not simple memory. They are an interleaving of other memories together with a certain aesthetic sensibility that he thinks she has. So if you're looking for restoration, if that really were your reason, your, your caution about doing restoration, then you would have to ask yourself whether you would succeed in doing the kind of thing that Morris thinks Kelmscott does to Ellen there by doing the restoration. Now, that's a very difficult question to answer, of course, in, in, when, you, when you're thinking about it, and I think is a good discipline to answer. But it isn't an answer that is automatically given by whether or not the thing is just as it was when you found it suitably 
protected or whether it is something more of a restoration. Second thing, you know, that kind of associationist thinking was very prevalent, as I say, probably the dominant strand through 18th century thought and well into the, well into the 19th. But it is not a majority view, I think, anymore. Um, a lot of people think that there is something too anthropocentric about thinking that value is invested just in those sorts of mental reactions. And there's something of an irony, I think. So we go back to the notion of irony here. Um, if you thought that your conservation policy was based on an, a, a philosophical idea which is of limited appeal, I think, to most people, and itself is anthropocentric in a somewhat unattractive way. Anyway, so let me leave there the thought that it is, um, that it is an intrinsic... Uh, sorry, that it is a kind of essential feature. And let me just say briefly, just for a couple of minutes, something about an alternative way of thinking of the general sort of SPAB way of thinking of the world, which is to see it not as, a, not as an inviolable principle, but as a rule of thumb, the kind of thing which you should you could usefully deploy first. Um, and I think there are two ways, there are two ways of, of thinking of this. One way, let, let me give what I think is, is really the very bad way of understanding this first, and then we'll come back to what I think is a much more defensible way. I think the really bad way of understanding this is by saying something like, look, architecture is controversial. Right. So different people have different views about what should be done. So we should avoid doing anything. Right? That is a very, very bad argument, I think. Imagine that in any other um, area of aesthetic or even political valuation. Suppose someone said, look, the distribution of income is an immensely complicated and controversial subject. Some people think you know, we should be in a more free market environment. Some people think we should be in a more egalitarian environment. It's really difficult to resolve that question. So I propose the following useful tactic, leave it as it is. Right? That is not a good way of resolving that issue. You need an argument for thinking that a free market is a good idea. You need an argument for thinking that progressive taxation gives rise to a redistribution which is juster than less. And that's what we see in that area. People provide those arguments. They don't just stop. Even worse, I think, is the thought, look, all value is subjective, it's all relative, who can say anything, therefore we shouldn't touch anything. If you really thought it was all subjective and there was nothing to be said about anything, then that's a really good reason for thinking you can do what you like. In fact, I think nobody really, or very few people, certainly working in this area, genuinely believe that, it, um, that, that, that there's nothing to be got there. It's, it's more the controversial thought. OK, so if you reject, if you don't think that's the thing, what do you think, what do you think is the right thing? I think the right thing to say is that um, we're really, really prone to getting carried away. We are really prone to self-deception. We are really prone to thinking that we can do things better when we can't. Um, so let me just say a little bit about that. There's a big psychological literature on this. Um, big empirical psychology literature on this. But just to give you an example of the kind of thing I mean, it's easy to think that temptation just involves being led by desire. If you look at the empirical literature on it, it suggests that it's not just that your desire changes, that you're led by the desire, but that your judgments change in the light of that desire. So a classic set of experiments here. You've probably come across these famous marshmallow experiments where you put a kid in front of a marshmallow and say you can eat this at any time but if you wait you can have two marshmallows. These were experiments done by Walter Michel in the 60s. They've been replicated in many different ways. Um, very young children are hopeless at this. They just take the one marshmallow. Um, once kids get to the age of about six or seven they start getting the self-control needed. They can hold out Turns out American children have changed, so now they all hold out. Probably their parents told them about the marshmallow test earlier. <laughs> Turns out to be highly diagnostic of later success and all kinds of other things. 
interestingly, though, some of Michelle's students took people, took two groups. Um, it's better not to do it just with marshmallows. Do, do it with marshmallows and chewing gum. So you say, which do you prefer? Let's say they say marshmallow. You say, right, you can have the chewing gum. But if you wait, you can have the marshmallow. Um, if you ask people after, if you ask the children straight away how much they prefer the marshmallow to the chewing gum, they put it on a scale of, you know, one to ten, they'll say, oh, marshmallows, they're up there, you know, eight or nine, chewing gum five. Right. If you go into a second group, you don't want to prejudice them by asking them early on because they then will fix on those numbers, but if you go into a second group where you don't ask them early on, but you ask them after about 10 minutes, that is at the point at which people start to succumb, then they will um, tend to say that they think the marshmallow is worth, you know, six or seven. The value of the marshmallow goes down as they wait for it until it converges on the value of the gum. So when they switch judgment, it's when they switch choice, it's not simply that their desires have pulled them one way, they just can't bear to wait. It's that they have changed their evaluation in the light of those desires. Now, once we know that about ourselves, I think it leads to a great modesty, or at least it should lead to a great modesty, because you realize that the things, the choices that you are making are very often going to be pulled by certain desires which are pulling the judgments that you make in a certain way. That means that when one tries to make judgments about what's a good thing to do in many of these cases, you should realize that those judgments may be being pulled in the wrong sort of way. And that's why I think you need to slow down and take it step by step and get as far away from whatever the temptations are that you think <coughs> might be corrupting the judgment. Now, in architecture, it's even more difficult, I think, because there are clearly long-run swings of fashion which you look back on and you're not quite sure what to make of. So, you know, classic examples in Pancras Station, reviled for the um, first half of the 20th century, actually well into the second half of the 20th century. You can read architectural critics in the 1960s, 1970s, still saying what a hideous building the hotel there is, the, the, the Scott Hotel should, should, clearly be, um, should clearly be demolished. Now, complete reversal, it seems. It's very hard to find anyone who thinks that that hotel should have been pulled down. In fact, it's become you know, a great popular symbol. It's not a, it's not a purist's building anymore. It's become a, it's become a very, popular, very popular building. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to to focus on. But I think the th other thing we should focus on, and I'll just, I'll just leave on this point because I, I've got lots more I could say, but, but, but we're running out of time, is it's very easy to overlook the fact that not doing something involves a cost. Because it's very easy to think that all you, can, all you should be comparing to is how the building is with not doing something. Whereas, of course, what you should be thinking of, if you're thinking about the cost there, is a comparison between how things would be were you to do something. So not doing something is not a neutral position. Not doing something involves the divergence from how the thing would be were you to do something to it. Um, quick parallel on this. The Hippocratic Oath. Um, at least as, uh, as commonly evoked in the United States and to some extent in, in, in the UK. It's not actually Hippocratic, it's not actually ancient, it probably comes from the early 19th century, but the idea above all do no harm. Right? That looks like a really useful slogan, and it is a really useful rule of thumb, I think, to just slow a doctor down. But whenever anyone actually works on that in medical ethics, it's actually not a very useful slogan. Does it mean never do anything that harms anybody? Well, that can't be right, because very often in order to affect a useful treatment, you've got to do something that's harmful. Every time you stick a needle in somebody, you're harming them for some other thing. So it can't mean that you don't do anything at all harmful. It may just mean something more like, look, don't do something which on balance 
is harmful. That actually, the closest thing you've got in Hippocrates to that is something very similar to, to that, which is, uh, there's this line, practice two things in your dealings with disease, either help or do not harm the patient. I think that should be what we should think about with restoration come um, conservation. That is, there shouldn't be an absolute rule here. Maybe nobody thinks there is, but if you look at some of the, um, the cases that are made, it looks as though some people do think there is that absolute thing. It should rather be use the rule of thumb of the importance <coughs> of conservation as something to slow you down and make you think rather than as an absolute block. Let me finish that. <laughs> Shall we finish? I'm happy to answer questions for a couple of minutes. We've got, we've got a few minutes. Would, yeah, absolutely, if people would, would like to do that. Oh. I mean, I, my real aim was to encourage people to talk amongst themselves. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, partly. I think there were, there were a lot of reasons. I mean, you mean why Morris and, and, and Webb and the, the early people did that? Partly that. I think also partly they really started to look around them and see what was happening. So some of that was being done with very old-fashioned methods. I mean, scraping of plaster was being done with a, a bolster and a hammer, as it would always have been done. Um, but I think certainly the the sort of need for the thought of slowing down has become progressively greater as the capacity to destroy things very quickly has become greater. So yes, I, I think, I, I'm not sure that that's true of the originators, but I do think that's true of why the sort of SPAV line has been important through the 20th century, yes. Yes, so, yeah. So it just sort of influences that idea. And it very much, as you say, comes out of the socialist philosophy. Yeah, yeah. When you were talking about the Ruskinian idea of what is owned, it's very much to do with uh, surface texture and the idea of both Morris and Ruskin, the idea that a stone has acquired age by the mason that has worked in the Middle Ages. So it's about the surface of the stone and not so much what it sort of portrays. Yeah, good. No, I agree, absolutely. And, and of course, that, not just the, 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 the Mason's marks on it, but also that, that line, um, uh, some sweetness in the gentle lines which rain and sun had wrought. Um, and yeah, so I think these are arguments that, that are very powerful with respect to stone and to certain media. Um, so I was talking to someone yesterday who's, who's no longer here, but... Um, about uh, restoration of Morris's Red House, you know, currently going on, and um, issues there about the Dulux paint put on in the 1970s. Um, so, you know, some people supporting, actually, SPAB, supporting the idea that that paint should be retained. Now, that does have a texture, it's true, um, and there is something to be said for it, but against the idea that there should be a much more thoroughgoing restoration in that case, back to something closer to, the, to, to, to Webb and Morris. There, I, there it looks like dogma to me. I find it very hard to see. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. And I think, especially with stone, I mean, obviously, 
these things need some balance, right? I mean, it's, it's obviously there have been cases where stone restoration has just involved whole scale stripping out of perfectly viable stonework on the lines that you want crisper, crisper stone. Um, but if you've got to the point where it's decayed to the point where you need to start putting tiles in, um, of course, new stonework will be hard edged, but the same working of rain and wind that, Rus that uh, Ruskin was glorying in there is going to happen again. And it'll probably happen a little faster if we have some acid rain falling on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes, Very good. Yeah, yes, yes. In a way, you know, we, we can understand, I think, much better, as thanks to all the presentations we've heard today, exactly how the 17th century interior evolved and, its, and the significance of every aspect of it. But we, we haven't yet sort of seen that in the balance with, you know, the plans you may have for its continuing use. That's yeah, really no. Exciting discussion. Yes. I mean, you know, so, so, so Luke talked a little bit about furniture. This morning. So, so just to take one example of that, at the moment the choir are strung out in two rows of eight. It's very hard to focus a choir properly. In two rows of eight, they work much better in four rows of four, but there isn't really a way of using the current seating to do that. So there are a lot of little things like that, which, which yes. And, and it is, I mean, you know, a college chapel is a has very many intersecting users. It's, it's an ongoing Christian community. Um, it's also the main thing that people coming in to have a look at the college go and have a look at. Um, it's obviously a focus for the, the Victorian glass, for the Munich glass that we were looking at. It's also a focus for the, um, for the earlier glass as well as for all, for all the other things. So yes, I mean, thank you. We, 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 we are thinking about those things on that. Needs to go on. Yeah. Yes, when it comes to musical instruments, of course, all these arguments are to the power of X. Because look at the chapel. You have a fabric of 1635. You have glass of various states. They were, the fabric was built to make a statement. The glass, as we heard this afternoon, the, glass, the lateral glass was put there to make a, a theological statement. Into that, in between those, was put the organ, which was there to make a musical statement. An organ is a frozen piece of music. We would, if that organ could be restored to as it was first built, we would actually hear exactly the same sounds as they heard in the 18th century. Just as we see through in those glass windows, either the east window or the lateral windows, just what they saw when they were first put in. Corrosion and other things allowing it. Now, why treat an organ differently if one wanted to, from the stained glass. Why is it treated differently from the woodwork? If we appreciate the woodwork in the same tactile way, in the same visual way, as it, as it would have been appreciated when first built, 
should we not treat the organ in the same oral way and try to get back to as it was when it was first built? Or do we treat organs differently? We say, well, the music evolved. The music is no longer the music of the 1760s. So organs have to change and you know, evolve with that. Where do we stop this process? Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I think we use the same criteria for organs that we use for the rest of the fabric. I think there is, each of these things is different. Um, sorry? Do we really use the same criteria? Well, I, I think the framework is the same, but I think the parameters are, are, are somewhat different. I mean, so there is a particular issue with the repertoire that the current choir would typically be singing and also given the likely quality of singers that we will get in a small college like this one, you know, could we have a choir that worked well enough to keep the original organ running for it? I mean, your, your suggestion in your notes was take everyone to, to, uh, to Claire and, and um, spend some time working with the organ there. I think that's an excellent idea. I, I don't know what, whether that's something um, our new choir director would think of doing. Do, do you have any comments? Of um, <laughs> I, I think uh, the historic elements of the organ are absolutely, as, as your talk um, outlined earlier this afternoon, are absolutely vital, and I think the college is uh, uh, quite rightly concerned to uh, work with those aspects of the instrument. Um, but the um, comment by the lady um, a few rows ahead, who was talking about the uh, chapel as a living space, as one that we are using day to day, um, has certain contingent pressures on the way in which that instrument is used. Um, and the challenge is to respect both its historical integrity as an instrument and its uh, integrity is an instrument that is in everyday use within the liturgy. And I think we need to work out a way of doing that. We should probably stop, shouldn't we? Um, but thank you very much, and I hope you can come over now and then go on to the... Uh, can you talk about the restoration of Parliament? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because these are difficult choices, 
And it is very hard to know uh, where you stand in this river <coughs> of uh, evolution that began in the 1630s and continues today and goes into the future so that we make the right choices, not just for us now and all our communities, but for the future. Very difficult to be humble enough not to be carried away and do things which later generations might say, why on earth? In the beginning of the 21st century, did they do that? So, this is just uh, part of the conversation. It's not the end of it. And um, it's been an absolutely fabulous conference. I feel it's been so rich, so full of information, so many varied contributions from so many points of view that it, it feels to me as this has done exactly what it wanted, we wanted it to do, to have this um, conversation which involved lots of people from different places and different perspectives, and I hope the start of a conversation that can continue. But of course, this isn't quite the end of the conference. Uh, it now rests with me to invite you over to the Master's Lodge, where we can examine in more detail the portraits of uh, John Cousin and Andrew Pern and uh, the engravings of the chapel uh, over a, a glass or two, before we then go on to Trinity. I hope most of you will be coming to hear Blue Heron again. But may I ask you all to put your hands together to thank the organisers of this conference.